Anna Schaffner Brown is a dedicated Bible and theology student from Bend, Oregon, with a bachelor's in economics from Hillsdale College and a history of passionate work on behalf of the Unitarian Christian Movement. She is currently working for Living Hope International Ministries in their marketing and publishing division, co-leading the Unitarian Salt and Light Bible Study and online community, and is now assisting with the planting of Compass Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. In addition to all of this, she is also on the board of directors for Christian-Centered Counseling. While diligently serving the Unitarian Christian community, Anna is also taking classes in Biblical Hebrew with the Biblical Language Center. Please join me in welcoming Anna Brown. This is great. I think uh, Will Barlow. Where's Will? We need to get one of these for Compass Christian Church, don't you think? It feels like I'm driving a spaceship up here. I'm going to call it the HMS Lawrenceville. HMS stands for His Majesty's Ship. I mean, His Messiah's Ship. We're boldly going where everybody already was about 2,000 years ago. Before I begin, I would like to express my gratitude to the UCA for allowing me this opportunity. I'm so grateful. I'd also like to thank Jerry Werewolf and Dale Tuggy uh, for their help with my paper and my presentation. Uh, Sean Finnegan must know that words cannot express my gratitude for his mentorship during this process. Finally, and most importantly, I'd like to thank my husband, John. He has firmly supported me in this work for the last eight months now. And John, I'm grateful for your tireless and unending encouragement. Thank you. The Apostle Paul, penning the letter to the Colossians by the Holy Spirit, records a section in praise of the risen Christ in chapter one, verses 15 through 20. It begins like this. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. I'm interested tonight in this phrase. Why would Paul write this here? What does it mean, and what can it add to our understanding of Jesus? This is because Trinitarian Christians frequently level an accusation at us Unitarians where they say, you can't believe Jesus is just a mere man. But over the last century, archeologists and scholars have discovered that in the ancient world, certain humans were described as representing the divine. I will argue this evening that with this phrase, the image of God, the Bible describes all of humanity in these terms. We will focus in particular on two figures, Adam and Christ. I'll begin by defining the accusation of philanthropism and citing a modern example. Next, we'll discuss the conclusions arrived at by theologians as they have tried to understand the phrase, image of God. Then we'll journey into the ancient world to see what the biblical authors' contemporaries believed about images of gods and their relationship to the divine. By now, we will have built a biblical anthropology. So next, we will apply it to Christ. And I will show that in the New Testament, our perspective on Adam influences our perspective on the Messiah. Finally, I will discuss the implications for Christology from a Unitarian perspective. First, let's define philanthropism. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I know what a philanthropist is. It's a, uh, it's a heretic who gives away their money to charity. <laughs> Rather, from the Greek roots, silos, or mere, and anthropos, meaning man, philanthropism is the belief that Jesus is a mere man. In all the places I've found that discuss it, philanthropism is considered heresy. Here, some of us Unitarians struggle. We think, well, Jesus, Jesus isn't a mere man. He is special. But the term mere man here is not an accusation that Jesus is some run-of-the-mill regular Joe. Instead, it's, instead, putting down a human Jesus denigrates humanity. And Trinitarians do it in the belief that humanity is too lowly to represent God. I believe that Jesus is a man, and that there is nothing mere about that. Within the last century and a half, archaeologists and scholars have shown how the humanity God created was intended to rule on his behalf, representing him in and to creation. 
If we take this biblical perspective on humankind and apply it to our Lord and Savior, we see that as the human Messiah, he is everything mankind is supposed to be. And from the biblical perspective, that is a rich and beautiful thing. Kingdom Through Covenant is an excellent book. A year ago, I convinced Jerry Werewolf to take my copy with him to a conference and get it signed by Peter J. Gentry. So now you know something about me and the kind of person that I am. Since I disagree with Peter J. Gentry and Stephen Wellham on this point, I will quote them in a section where they explain why to them Jesus must be God. They say, quote, Scripture teaches that this Messiah is more than a mere man since he is identified with God. How so? Because in fulfilling God's promises, he literally inaugurates God's saving rule, kingdom, and shares the very throne of God, something no mere human can do, which entails that his identity is organically tied to the one true and living God, end quote. These claims are vague. To Gentry and Wellam, since Jesus, one, is identified with God, two, fulfills God's promises, and three, quote unquote, shares the throne of God, there is no other possible conclusion. He must be God. These authors conclude this section of their book with a list of accomplishments that apparently no mere man could have completed. Quote, in him as fully human, the glory and radiance of God is completely expressed since he is the exact image and representation of the Father. It is crucial to point out, to say that Jesus has done all this is to identify him as God the Son incarnate, fully God and fully man. It is for this reason that the New Testament presents Jesus in an entirely different category from any created thing. In fact, scripture so identifies him with Yahweh and all his actions, character, and work that he is viewed, as David Wells reminds us, as, quote, the agent, the instrument, and the personifier of God's sovereign, eternal, saving rule, end quote. Trinitarian and Unitarian Christians can agree that in Jesus, the glory and radiance of God is completely expressed. Amen. But the second claim here, that Jesus is, quote, in an entirely different category from any created thing, end quote, because he is the, quote, agent, instrument, and personifier of God's saving rule, end quote, flies in the face of the ancient Near Eastern culture in which the Bible was written. On the contrary, in the ancient Near East, kings and image statues were seen as the, quote, unquote, agents, quote, unquote, instruments, and, quote, unquote, personifiers of divine rule. And the book of Genesis gives this role to all of humanity. Despite Trinitarian concerns to the contrary, in the biblical perspective, a human being can and does serve as, to echo David Wells, quote, the agent, instrument, and personifier of God's saving rule, end quote. But before we apply the ancient Near Eastern worldview to Christ, we'll need to journey into the Old Testament and take a tour through ancient Egypt and Babylon. Don't lose heart. We will make it back to the New Testament as we bring these ideas to bear on Christ. In the Hebrew scriptures, humankind is referred to as the image and likeness of God at three instances, all in the first chapters of Genesis. Each time, the significance of the statement, though perhaps not its meaning, is apparent. The first thing God says about humanity is, let us make man in our image after our likeness, here in Genesis 1.26. The next two uses of the phrase summarize God's creation in chapter 5, verse 1, and clarify the gravity of murder in chapter 9, verse 6. The relative scarcity of image of God texts, coupled with the idea's massive significance, have led to centuries of theologians trying to speculate what it could mean. Comments Hendrikus Burkhoff, quote, by studying how systematic theologies have poured meaning into Genesis 126, one could write a piece of Europe's cultural history, end quote. What Burkhoff means, of course, is that theologians with scant textual evidence to exegete the phrase image of God have instead used the anthropology in vogue during their lifetime to build an interpretation. Let's do a brief tour through history. Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria and Athanasius seem to have ascribed to a theory about the image of God that's sometimes referred to as divinization. That is, 
It's a partaking of the divine nature through salvation. Augustine famously posited that in the same way that God, he thought, is a trinity, so each human being must have been created in the image of the trinity too. He settled on memory, intellect, and will as the three components of each three-part human. How do you feel about that, friend? Do you, uh, do you feel like a trinity tonight? <laughs> Other theologians didn't either. Martin Luther settled on obedience to God as the meaning of the image of God, meaning that you could be more or less the image of God depending on your conformity to his will. Finally, in our time, postmodern Christianity tends to posit that we are the image of God only in our relationships with others. Stanley Grenz represents this perspective when he says, quote, the image of God does not lie in the individual per se, but in the personality of persons in community, end quote. You, my friend, are not made in the image of God, but perhaps your family or your community or this group of people is. In short, without more biblical or archaeological data, thinkers have found it impossible to know what the book of Genesis means when it says that a man is made in the image and likeness of God. And for these theologians, the necessary source material had not yet been discovered. That is, until the last century and a half. J. Richard Middleton, in his book, The Liberating Image, the Imago Dei in Genesis 1, evaluates a 1988 doctoral dissertation by Gunlager A. Johnson, saying that it, quote, shows that the degree of consensus among Old Testament scholars is close to unanimity, end quote. Old Testament scholars are almost all on the same page about the image of God. But what is that page? According to Middleton, the consensus takes two factors into account. First, royal aspects of the biblical creation account. Second, the ancient Near Eastern thought world behind image of God language. The royal tone is found first in Genesis 1, 26 through 27. It reads, quote, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. This is the first statement about God's creation of humanity. It is composed of essentially two parts. First, mankind is to be made in God's image and likeness. And second, mankind is to have dominion over all the earth. Many Hebrew scholars believe the second is the function of the first. David J. A. Kleins writes in his article, Humanity as the Image of God, quote, Genesis 126 may well be rendered, let us make humanity as our image so that they may rule, end quote. Kleins justifies this reading by pointing out that the Hebrew text vav, or and, can carry the force of so that. Gentry and Wellam concur. They write, quote, the correct translation, therefore, is let us make man so that they may rule, end quote. A similar text may prove illustrative. Kleins points to the creation of the sun and the moon in Genesis 1, 16 through 18. It goes, quote, and God made the two great lights and God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness, end quote. Here, the creation of the two great lights is immediately followed by their purpose, their function, what they do. Taking this verse into consideration when looking at the creation of humanity just 10 verses later, there is a similar construction that follows creation with purpose. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. What do the sun and moon do? They give light. What do humans do? They have dominion. Christians can gain insight into the Bible by studying the cultures that shaped or reflected Israel's worldview. And we don't have to elevate secular or pagan sources to the authority of scripture to do it. When the biblical authors wrote, they used local language and cultural expressions of their time. As it happens, when we look for examples of images and the phrase image of a God in ancient cultures, we find two helpful examples, Egypt, and Babylon. We have evidence for Egyptian influence on Israelite culture baked into the text. 
In Acts chapter 7, verse 22, Stephen says that, quote, Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, end quote. Young Moses grows up among the Egyptian nobility. He speaks and writes their language and does business with Egyptian ways of thinking. Moses, of course, is traditionally credited with writing the Torah. But even if a later scribe compiled the Pentateuch, Hebrew slavery in Egypt had already left an indelible mark on Israelite culture. Thus, any Egyptian phrases that parallel the Genesis account are worth our study. It just so happens that an abundance of inscriptions in ancient Egypt call the Pharaoh the image of a lowercase g god. This is how we know, Kleins writes, that, quote, the terminology of the image of God is understood in the ancient Near East almost exclusively of the king. In a text from the 14th century BC, the Egyptian god Amon, or Amon-Re, addresses Pharaoh Amenhotep III as, quote, my living image, creation of my members, end quote. Note that this text not only refers to the king as the image of his god, but it also seems to establish some kind of procreational relationship, as if the god birthed him. Now, listen to this next one. A text from the same period has the same god address the pharaoh. Quote, you are my beloved son, who came forth from my members, my image, whom I have put on earth. I have given to you to rule the earth in peace, end quote. I was surprised when I first encountered these phrases, which to my ear sound like the Bible in an ancient Egyptian text. But the new kingdom of Egypt is replete with similar references to the Pharaoh. They serve rhetorically to elevate the Pharaoh to the status of representative of the Egyptian pantheon. Please note the dates of these inscriptions. They fall within the currently accepted approximately two century date range for the Exodus, which means that we can know with some certainty that the enslaved Hebrews lived in a world where people spoke like this. I counted 55 occurrences of the phrase image of God with reference to a Pharaoh that occur within the early and late dates for the Exodus event if we include Hatshepsut, who reigned in the decades before the earliest Exodus date, the phrase is used 59 times. And these are just the inscriptions, steles, and texts that remain to this day. Take a look at this chart. The text may be a little small, but it represents nine pharaohs who ruled between the beginning of the 15th and end of the 13th century BC by how many times they're referred to as the image of a god in the Egyptian pantheon. Note our most impressive, Amenhotep III. Archaeologists have found 18 instances of the phrase image of lowercase god that refer to him. What's most notable about this timeline is that it represents the majority of the pharaohs from this time period, each referred to as a god's quote-unquote image. This Egyptian inscription shows a functional aspect to this relationship. Quote, while you, Amon, are in heaven and illuminate the world, he, Amenhotep III, is on earth to carry out your kingship, end quote. From the perspective of the royal cult, this pharaoh's kingship was literally enacting the rulership of the Egyptian god, but on earth instead of in heaven. In Egyptian dynasties centuries before these inscriptions, so before the earliest Exodus date, pharaohs did not claim to be the image of a god. No, no, they said that they were the god's physical incarnation, the god himself. But texts like this one demonstrate both a close relationship and a distinction in the Egyptian mind. See, in this text, Amenhotep III is a close relative to this lowercase g god Amon, but not necessarily Amon himself. Middleton summarizes this representative aspect, quote, in ancient Egypt, as the deputy and representative of the god on earth, the king's exploits were the god's exploits, end quote. Curtis says, quote, the fact that the king is described as the image of God seems to presuppose his creation or procreation by the god, end quote. That is to say, to be the image of a god was equivalent to being the son of the god. Hang on to that. This aspect of image of God language will come to light when we talk about the Gospel of Luke. But let us return to the biblical account. 
Humanity's creation in God's image, especially in light of the dominion mandate that immediately follows, communicates that Adam and Eve are to do for Yahweh what Amenhotep III supposedly did for his God. Humans carry out Yahweh's rulership on earth. Now, Genesis doesn't just copy Egypt's ideas about the king's relationship to the divine. No. It responds to and critiques the ancient Near Eastern conception of the image of a god, first by democratizing it. In Genesis, the entirety of humanity is made in God's image, not just the king. Second, where some early pharaohs and other ancient Near Eastern depictions of kings as the image of God imply that the king is the literal incarnation or some kind of avatar of that god, the Genesis text makes it clear. Adam and Eve are created beings. They are not Yahweh himself. Scholars frequently use the word viceroy to describe this kind of rulership, and that's apt here. According to the Oxford Dictionary, a viceroy is a ruler exercising authority in a colony on behalf of a sovereign. And that is exactly what Adam and Eve are doing. They are not Yahweh. They are created beings. They do, however, rule in his world on his behalf. Klein says that to have a mortal being represent the creator to his creation allows God to be imminent without compromising his transcendence. Quote, in this juxtaposition of two aspects of the divine nature, the author of Genesis 1 has both freed God from bondage to the world order by asserting the creaturehood of all that is not God and has ensured that the statement about the imminence of God firmly excludes any possibility of humanity's divinization. For humans, too, are explicitly said to be creatures of God, end quote. This author goes on to say that through the creation of Adam, quote, in a sense, the word becomes flesh. The word calls the creation into existence, but the image of God is the permanent link between God and his world, end quote. According to Klein's, Adam's clear status as a created being precludes any claim that he or all humanity is God incarnate. In or in our context, a member of the Godhead. Rather, mankind represents God to creation. Psalm 8 elucidates the biblical worldview on the creation of man. Let's read verses 4 through 8 together. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. Gentry and Wellam comment on this section, saying, quote, verses 5 through 8 constitute a word-by-word -word commentary and meditation on Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Psalm 8, 6 through 8 details and unfolds the rule of mankind specified in Genesis 1, 26b. It is clear and obvious that the psalm writer has the text of Genesis 1, 26 before his mind. Note in particular that the terms in Hebrew for crown, glory, and honor are all royal terms. This shows that the psalm writer understood image to speak of royal status, end quote. Let us turn to Babylon. It's difficult to find many texts from ancient Mesopotamia, period. Middleton says, quote, the geographical region corresponding to ancient Mesopotamia is notorious for the relative rarity of manuscript finds, end quote. In fact, Edward Curtis, in his masterful doctoral dissertation, could only find five explicit uses of the phrase image of God throughout five centuries of Mesopotamian history. Middleton generously counts Seven. Nevertheless, almost all of these Neo-Assyrian inscriptions portray the king as the image of God, and notably, one of them designates a priest as the image of God. It's the directions for an incantation to drive away sickness, and it reads, quote, the incantation is the incantation of Marduk, the incantation priest is the Salmu image of Marduk, end quote. Here, the priest stands in for the pagan deity. As image, he performs an incantation on the god's behalf. Note that the word for image, salmu, is a cognate of the Hebrew equivalent, tselem. Let's talk about the biblical picture of mankind as priests. To moderns, 
Adam and Eve's duties in the Garden of Eden can seem demeaning. They came into this world to be what? Gardeners? But textual hints show that Genesis is describing the Garden of Eden as a sacred space. Gentry and Wellam draw parallels between the Garden of Eden and the Jewish temple to argue that Eden, too, was where God dwelt and ruled. Daniel Leoy, in his article, The Garden of Eden as Primordial Temple or Sacred Space for Humankind, he put it all in the title, guys. You know what his thesis is. Summarizes, quote, an examination of the creation narrative points to Eden as the earliest occurring sacred space, as well as a prototype and archetype for future temples, end quote. If Eden was a sacred space, then Adam and Eve were its priests. God's directions to work and keep the Garden of Eden use the same Hebrew verbs that describe the work of the temple priests in Numbers 3, 7 through 8, 8, 26, and 18, 5 through 6. Genesis 2.15 reads, quote, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Compare it to Numbers 3.7. They, the priests, shall keep guard over him and over the whole congregation before the tent of meeting as they minister at the tabernacle. The same Hebrew verbs, le'avda and le'shamra, appear in each of these verses, describing the responsibilities of mankind in Genesis and the priesthood in Numbers. In the ancient world, this biblical anthropology is revolutionary. If you're an Egyptian commoner, say, you know what it means to be an image of God, of a God. You know it means to be king, and that only the king is the image of a God. And then you encounter Yahweh. Reading the Hebrew scriptures, you see that in Genesis 1, the most high creator, not just any God, the most high creator, made all of humankind in his image. This means that you, too, were made to represent Yahweh. What kind of dignity does that give? And not just for you, but for your servants, for your sisters and brothers, your children, all were made with this dignity. The Hebrew scriptures not only honor humanity, they challenge you to honor and respect your fellow humans in a way that is different from every other religion and culture in the then known world. The fact that Babylon has fewer examples of image of God texts than Egypt presents a small problem for bringing this idea to bear on our Christology. Because Israel was in Egypt over a millennia before the birth of the Christ and the writing of the New Testament. As we approach the time of the New Testament, we need to know what people thought of the image of God in the first century. Let's read an anecdote about Hillel, a rabbi who lived at about the same time as the Christ's ministry. Quote, Hillel the elder, at the time that he was departing from his students, would walk with them. They said to him, Rabbi, where are you walking to? He said to them, to fulfill a commandment, to bathe in the bathhouse. Just like regarding the statues or icons of kings that are set up in the theaters and the circuses, the one who is appointed over them bathes them and scrubs them, and they give him sustenance. And furthermore, he attains status with the leaders of the kingdom. I, who was created in the divine image and form, as it is written, for in the image of God he made man even more so. Hillel interpreted the image of God by comparing himself to a king's statue. This first century contemporary of the Christ considered physical images as a parallel to the image of God. Thankfully, despite the relative scarcity of later Babylonian texts about an image of God, physical images of gods, that is, idols, were ubiquitous in nearly all the cultures surrounding Israel. Most of the later Old Testament occurrences of the Hebrew word rendered image in Genesis, Tselem, refer to idols. And so, perhaps it's ironic, any serious study of biblical anthropology should include idols. Though the phrase image of a god is relatively scarce in Babylonian texts around the time of Israel's captivity there, images in the form of literal idols abounded. Cult images in Mesopotamia, says Middleton, were first made in a workshop and then consecrated, quote, by means of an elaborate ritual, typically known as the mouth washing or sometimes the mouth opening ritual, end quote. Idols in Mesopotamia were thought to be alive because they contained some refined material from the god called fluid, spirit, or breath, animating them to become the living representative of a divine being. 
Perhaps this has something to do with Genesis chapter 2. Quote, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. End quote. Do these ideas reflect each other? Does Genesis use commonly accepted ancient rituals around idolatry to tell us that as an idol statue is to its God, so humankind is to Yahweh? A type of image common to the ancient Near East that we seldom hear in this discussion is statue images of kings, which represented the authority of the king. Ancient kings left statues of themselves in territories they conquered. So say, if you're an Assyrian king and you just conquered a new city, the first thing you're going to do is have an image of yourself set up in that land. The big statue says, I'm Ashurbanipal and I own this place. A similar significance of images is found in the Roman Empire that forms a cultural backdrop to the New Testament. Morton Warmond writes, quote, the significance of the picture of the emperor can be illustrated by the fact that all depictions of the emperor were cult images and therefore sacrosanct. At the foot of the emperor's statue, a person was unpunishable. When a slave was sold, the seller was obliged to inform the prospective buyer about whether the slave had ever run to an image of the emperor. For our Christology, we can note that no one believed that an image of Caesar was Caesar himself, but that any statue rep image of Caesar represented the emperor and his authority in all the Roman Empire was assumed to be fact. Another note about physical images. Without the figure they represent, they're worthless. Where, were Caesar to die or to be defeated, his statue would mean little. Certainly it wouldn't be revered. In the same way, without God, humanity and Christ are without value. Only the thing that it represents gives meaning and significance to the image. Jews living in the first century cultural context would be surprised at the modern American paucity of real life examples of images. For them, living in a world where kings claim, claim representative status of the gods and idol statues abound, the biblical creation account clearly honored and exalted humanity to the status of divinely ordained viceroys and priests of God. In sum, Middleton writes, quote, the imago Dei, or image of God, designates the royal office or calling of human beings as God's representatives and agents in the world, granted authorized power to share in God's rule or administration of the earth's resources and creatures, end quote. But what does this have to do with the price of bread? Who cares what Amenhotep III thought about himself and his pagan gods? What does it matter if Eden was a temple, since we don't live there? In the New Testament, writers both designate Christ as the image of God and compare Jesus to Adam, both explicitly and implicitly. Let us return to Colossians, where Paul writes, quote, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, end quote. What did Paul mean when he called Jesus the image of the invisible God? Colossians is not just using flowery language. This phrase is deliberate. When Paul applies image of God language to Jesus and uses the same designation given to Adam and Eve in the creation account, he uses terminology familiar to readers of the Hebrew scriptures to categorize Jesus as a member of the human race, even as in context, he exalts him to the apex of it. The Theological Dictionary of the New Testament points out that the statement is deliberate. Quote, Paul equates Christ with the Adam intended in Genesis 1.27, end quote. Let's imagine for a moment that you are recording a poem about the Christ and your big goal is to prove that Jesus is God. Indeed, that he must be. Isn't that kind of a lame start? Clearly referring to Jesus with the same designation given to the first humans, anyone in ancient Israel would recognize that an image of a god or king represents or stands in for that god or king. In the same way, Jesus represents God on earth. Indeed, he must. Paul emphasizes God's transcendence, and with it, the need for a representative with the word invisible. In one phrase, he not only tells us that Jesus is God's representative, but why? 
For us, this text should now call to mind an earlier Egyptian text. Remember, while you, Amon, are in heaven and illuminate the world, he, Amenhotep III, is on earth to carry out your kingship. When Paul calls Jesus God's image, he is classifying him as the imminent representative of the transcendent God. Here, the New Testament illustrates Jesus as the one vested with God's authority, designated and empowered to represent him to the parts of the world under God's control. Like a statue left in a conquered land, Christ's presence in our hearts shows that here, God rules. Further, when Paul uses image of God language of Jesus, he is deliberately making use of the first designation for all humanity and applying it to the Christ. Explicit New Testament, New Testament comparisons between Jesus and Adam show just as Adam was the first progenitor of humanity, Paul thinks of Jesus as the progenitor of a new kind of human race. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 22 reads, For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. End quote. Paul does not compare a divine Jesus to a mere man, Adam. On the contrary, the similarity between them is explicit. Paul refers to Adam and Jesus, each as a man, without apology. To Paul, the difference between the two is outcome. In Adam, all die, but in Christ, all will be made alive. A similar comparison takes place in Romans. Quote, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. End quote. That's Romans 5, verses 14 and 17. In the first verse quoted here, Adam is the quote unquote type of the one who was to come, referring to Jesus. The word rendered type in the ESV is the Greek word tupos, and it means type, dye, pattern, print, or stamp. Here again, Paul binds Jesus and Adam together in their status as first man and draws a distinction between their respective outcomes through Adam, death, and through Jesus, life. If Jesus is God, what is Paul doing? Why would he repeatedly compare Jesus and Adam without drawing that vital distinction? If we are offended to think that Jesus and Adam can be compared, we should check our hearts, not worrying that we denigrate Jesus, but searching to find if we adequately appreciate the humanity God created to bear his image. It isn't just Paul who draws comparisons between the two figures. The author of Hebrews interprets Psalm 8, the royal psalm we read earlier, by applying it to the Christ in chapter 2, verses 5 through 9, concluding, quote, We see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone, end quote. This is not an explicit comparison. It specifically names Jesus only not Adam. But to apply to Jesus a meditation on the creation of the first humans is certainly an implicit comparison between the two figures, and it shows that the New Testament mind sees Jesus as embodying and fulfilling God's design for that first human. Another implicit comparison, perhaps the most intriguing, occurs in Luke. The evangelist notably bestows the title Son of God on two individuals. Of course, Jesus receives the appellative multiple times in this gospel, but Adam too is called the son of God in Luke. His designation is found in Jesus's genealogy, which goes backwards from Jesus all the way to creation. The genealogy concludes, quote, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God, end quote. Gavin Ortland, in his article, Image of Adam, Son of God, argues that Genesis 5-3, where Adam fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth, draws a parallel between Adam and God on the one hand and Seth and Adam on the other. If Seth in God's image and likeness is his son, then Adam in God's image and likeness must be God's son too. Trinitarian commentators struggle with this detail in Luke. Why would the evangelist call Adam the son of God immediately following Jesus' baptism? 
where a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased, some 15 verses prior. Referring to Adam by one of Jesus' titles, especially in such close proximity in the text, seems to make a comparison between Jesus and Adam. From a Trinitarian perspective, Luke 3.38 presents a problem because Adam cannot possibly be a member of the Godhead, but Jesus is supposed to be God. But Unitarians are in a uniquely privileged position to understand the verse. And indeed, Luke's intention in applying the same moniker to both Jesus and his ancestor. In the greater scriptural narrative, Adam and Jesus are described as fulfilling analogous roles. Both are rulers of God's creation, representative images of the transcendent God, priests to God, and progenitors of a kind of human race. God designed each of them to live in covenant with him and carry out his authority. In biblical scholarship, a shift in understanding the image of God has taken place almost entirely within the last century. Even now, it is filtering down from the academy into the popular consciousness through resources like the Bible Project and books like Michael Heiser's The Unseen Realm. As popular theology sees Edenic humanity in the status of royal priestly viceroys of Yahweh, perhaps a time is coming when we can acknowledge that a human need not be God to represent him. Michael Heiser, himself a Trinitarian, explains image of God language in Genesis in a way that rings Christological. Listen to this. Quote, humankind was created as God's image. If we think of imaging as a verb or function, that translation makes sense. The image is not an ability we have, but as a status. We are his representatives on earth. To be human is to image God. This is why Genesis 1, 26 through 27 is followed by what the theologians call the dominion mandate in verse 28. The verse informs us that God intends us to be him on this planet, end quote. Writing in 2015, Heiser correctly ascertains the functional aspect of the image of God. Genesis 1, 26 through 28 empowers humanity to be God's quote unquote representatives on earth. Remember how earlier in my presentation, Gentry and Wellam quoted a scholar who said that Jesus must be God because among other reasons, he is identified with God, fulfills God's promises and quote unquote shares the throne of God. Heiser, also a Trinitarian, apparently disagrees. Here he says, we humans are God's representatives on earth. To Unitarians, comparing Jesus and Adam isn't uncomfortable. You see, like Adam, Jesus was made to be God's representative to the created world order. He is empowered to be God's viceroy, to represent the invisible God on and to the earth. Heiser's concluding statement is intended to refer to humanity, but it could easily refer to Christ. Unitarians can openly assert that in a similar way to how God intended Adam and Eve to be him on this planet, so to speak, during his ministry, God intended Christ to quote unquote, be him on this planet. So which is it? Are humans inadequate to represent God or are we designed to represent God. Is humanity incapable of keeping covenant or was mankind intended to be in relationship with God? Must the Messiah too be God? Was humanity exalted, empowered, and later pushed to the back seat of our destiny? Many scholars still stubbornly assert that only God can take on the Messiah's mantle. Gentry and Wellam contend that the whole biblical history, beginning with Adam, serves to prove that only God can keep covenant with God. Quote, who is able or what kind of person is able to fulfill all God's promises, inaugurate his saving rule in this world, and establish all that is associated with the new covenant? The answer in biblical thought is clear, they say. It is God alone who can do it and no one else. He must unilaterally act if there is going to be any redemption, end quote. Gentry and Wellam are asserting that only God can bring about salvation, which is certainly the case. Only God has the authority and the power to effect change in his world. But beyond just that, these authors argue that God could not possibly include in the process a human being. 
I am shocked at these two authors' willingness to place limits on the all-knowing and all-powerful creator of the universe. The same authors who asserted earlier that Adam was created to represent God as his viceroy on earth here assert that, quote, God must unilaterally act if there is going to be any redemption, end quote. To the scholars hanging on to the false accusation of philanthropism, while teaching an exalted and empowered humankind, I say this, you can't have both. Either a human can represent God or no human can. The time is ripe for Christians to leave this mere man rhetoric aside and acknowledge that a human Messiah can represent God. I have shown tonight that in biblical anthropology, there is nothing mere about man. From the beginning, God designed humanity to represent him and to rule his world. Adam's failure and the subsequent failures of other covenant heads came after the creation of humankind in Genesis 1. It was a problem, not an inherent aspect of God's design. And Jesus, instead of representing God's abandonment of partnering with humanity, stepped forward and rectified this mistake, becoming everything humanity was originally intended to be. In his work on his understanding of the incarnation, the person of Christ, David Wells writes, quote, the saving and vindicating rule of God has been born with Jesus, yet it is also plain that this is the rule of God, end quote. To Wells, when Jesus describes his ministry in terms of the kingdom of God, he must be hinting that he is God because no human can reign over God's kingdom. But in the ancient Near Eastern mindset, even a statue could stand in for the authority of a God. How much more could a human image of God represent Yahweh? Ancient Near Eastern parallels show us that the language of the Genesis creation is filled with significance. Mankind was designed to rule over and represent God to creation. Adam and Eve were further intended to fulfill the role of priests in God's cosmic primordial temple space. In light of this elevated initial status of humankind, Christians should not be surprised when later New Testament texts explicitly and implicitly compare Jesus and Adam, nor should we fear classifying Jesus as a man. I hope that tonight I have armed you with a perspective to respond to accusations that your beliefs denigrate Jesus. When someone asks you, how could you possibly believe Jesus is just a human? You can talk to them about ancient Egypt, point them to this presentation, or send them to resources more in their sphere, like the Bible Project, to show them that the role of humanity was intended to and that Jesus does fulfill. Recognizing that a human being can and does represent God is not inappropriate, it's biblical. And with this tool, I'd like to offer you a challenge. What did Uncle Ben say? Oh yeah, Uncle Ben said, with great knowledge comes great responsibility. Now that, you, now that you have this information, I challenge you not to let it lie. During this conference, you've sat through presentations, you've met with fellow Unitarians, and I pray that your time has been blessed. There's more to come. As you return home from this time, consider in your heart, what is the conversation I can have, the person I can invite, the friend to whom I can offer a resource? Where are you calling me, God, to open this conversation? And when you next hear an accusation that Unitarians believe in a mere man Jesus, remember, if limited corporeal humanity was created to serve as kings and priests to God, there is nothing mere about man. A human Christ can represent God. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Anna, for that insightful presentation. We have a few questions from our audience. In what sense is Jesus the unique image of God, if any? And in what sense is this image the same as that of Adam and other humans? Oh, wow. Uh, so I would say that when it comes to Jesus being the unique image of God, uh, which he certainly is, I think that Jesus has been given greater authority than any human being other than Adam has ever received. So think about it, like uh, if you 
if you did the worst thing that you could possibly ever imagine doing, it would be very difficult for you to change the history of the entire course of the world. You don't have the authority to do that. But Adam was given that. Adam was given an opportunity to really botch it, and he, and he did, and uh, put a curse on the entire earth. And Jesus was given the opportunity to rectify that, and he did. And so uh, I think that when it comes to image of God, meaning like authority and being God's representative, there is a sense in which Adam and Jesus do that differently than the rest of us do. What's the, can you remind me of the second part of that question? Is what sense is Jesus as the image of God the same as uh, Adam and the rest of humanity? Oh, yeah. Uh, in the same sense that Adam was given this uh, authority of the image of God, we uh, were created to represent God to the earth. Now, for most of us, I believe that we are not living that out very well. But think about it. Think about if you were like, if you like had someone come up to you tomorrow and tell you that you're actually the long lost uh, great great grandson of a king and that you're actually the heir to a throne, that would be innate. It would be innate whether you were acting like a king or not, whether you were on the throne or not, it would still be the case that you were the great great grandson of that king. And I believe that it's the same way with the image of God with human beings, is that God gave us this original intention for us to carry out his authority in the world. Thank you. In one sentence, how would you respond to the charge? So you believe Jesus is just a mere man, right? That's great. So I, I, I think it would just depend on who I was talking to. Uh, if I was speaking to someone who I felt really comfortable with and I think could follow me, then in one, in one sentence, I would say that, I would, I would say my tagline, which is there's nothing mere about man. And I would point out that in the ancient world, which is where the Bible was written, uh, human beings represented their gods to the earth. And that we know that because they were called the image of a god when they did that. Thank you. Our next question is this. Did humans retain the image of God after the fall, or did they lose it? Is there scriptural evidence for humans continuing to function as the image of God after the fall? If all humans are images of God, how is Christ as the image of God unique? Okay, the second one we've already pursued. So uh, did humans retain the image of God after the fall, and what scriptural evidence could there be for that? Oh man, that is the question that so many theologians have struggled with. Like think of Martin Luther, where he was, uh, he believed that humanity had just totally lost it. He called it original righteousness, obviously in German. He called it original righteousness, and he believed that human beings needed to like regain it through obedience to God. Um, scripturally, so I said that there are these uh, three times in the Old Testament that uh, humanity is referred to as the image of God. The third one is in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, and it's after Noah's flood, and God, God makes a covenant with Noah, and God tells Noah, basically the big rule of the covenant is that human beings can't kill each other. And he says human beings can't kill each other because humans were made in the image of God. That's the reasoning, and that's after the fall. So when we look at that, that's one reason to think of it. Another reason is that it's referenced in James chapter 3. In James chapter 3, uh, James is talking about uh, the tongue, and he says that the tongue is this like restless evil full of deadly poison, and it's because with the same mouth, we bless God and curse man who is made in the likeness of God. So that's a, another clear reference to Genesis. So James doesn't make this discrimination between like only Christians are made in the image of God. And Noah, of course, Noah's living after the fall. So God is telling Noah that people can't be murdered uh, because they're made in the image of God. So, there's, so those are scriptural reasons. Uh, to go even further, I would point you to some of the uh, Jewish resources, resources that were happening at the time. So like the book of Enoch, 
talks about the image of God a couple of different times. And when it does, it references all of humanity. It basically makes out like everybody's still made in the image of God. And then Hillel, which I referenced in my speech, makes no distinction between him and any other person as being made in the image of God. So uh, no, humans did not lose the image of God. There's no scriptural reference for that, even though a lot of theologians have wanted to think that. Um, and, and I totally understand why. Um, but yeah, there's no scriptural reason that, there's a couple scriptural reasons to think the opposite. Our next question on the tail end of that one. Uh, do you think that doctrines of total depravity or of original sin have had any relationship to this trend of denigrating uh, the idea of humanity being in the image of God? Yes. I think it's probably a chicken or the egg question, right? And I'm, I'm not sure that I have the, the church history chops to tell you, like, uh, was it, which came first? Uh, was it that uh, people believe that people lost the, the image of God and original sin came along with that? Or was it that uh, original sin and total depravity pushed into this idea that people lost the image of God? But yeah, I mean, everybody just wants to kick post-fall humanity, uh, whether God holds them to still being the image or not. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you.